Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. Before we talk about XRP, which I'm going to do today, and uh, yeah, I like today's content. I really am, as you know, super laser focused on the use case for XRP because I am just really wanting to see that progress. But before, I think it deserves a little bit of time to talk about VeChain. This is an example of what retail investors can do when it comes to impacting the price. And when there is FOMO, uh, this price increase happens. A project like this can decouple from BTC. I'm on the Cryptocurrency Live Prices website. This is my favorite site when I look at prices. And ever since I, you know, occasionally I talk about VeChain, occasionally I talk about Tezos. I was introduced to VeChain through Chris Rang of Bitru. He was really um, great because he brought Sunny Lou to the channel about seven months ago. We did an interview. Uh, the three of us did kind of a, a joint AMA, and I was very impressed with the project because they have customers that are like IBM, Ford, Dell, Cisco, 3M, Pricewaterhouse, uh, PricewaterhouseCooper now, as it's been, I guess, for a while. Um, but the um, product verification and traceability is really serving a real problem. So this is a case where you have a project that is getting very close to being what I would call a proven uh, capability. Mm. Because when we look at those market makers that were on the panel back in June 2019, they said that the investment money was staying out of the space until we could really show some proof of cases that have gone over the hurdle of just concept or white paper or, or getting to a uh, stage. Mm -hmm but those that are really making an impact on the space that are proven, I think VeChain is one. And you can see the reason why I like this site is because the first one is a one hour and you, no surprise here that some people are taking some profit. And then this is a 12 hour, 24 hour, seven days up 77%. And then check this out, 30 days up, 132%. And then the overall one year is up 106%. So it's a project that's moving on its own. And um, this is when people ask, why isn't XRP moving? Well, there's not a lot of new money in the space. A lot of the people who are holding are just holding. And there's not a lot of FOMO. So when you <clears throat> are not experiencing any FOMO, you're pretty much attached to what Bitcoin does. So here's the three month view. And you can see that VeChain started to pump on May 31st. And yeah, everyone should be careful because these small caps that are under a billion in market size, uh, they move up or down on very little uh, volume. So I'm just saying, and as all of you know, um, when you hold VeChain for a long time, as I have, and it's solving a real problem, I think we've just gotten started here. And that is also why in this space, you saw SBI make the recent announcement just this last week that they are going to get into the traceability in terms of blockchain too. So it makes sense. I think that this, this whole sector is probably poised to explode because Sunny has been able to prove <laughs> it, it really does uh, work. All right, let's move right along here. There is something I think everyone should know, and this is particularly those people living in the United States, that the American Bankers Association gave temp testimony at the Senate hearing on July 1st. And they think that the feds in regards to rolling out a digital dollar is not good. They're giving it a two thumbs down. They believe that it would relinquish too much power to the feds. And this association, which is in Washington, D.C., they are representing all the banks, all sizes and all charters. The principal activity, of course, is lobbying. 
and it represents 95% of the industry in the U.S., employing 2 million men and women. So they have a very strong voice. And it is estimated in 2019 that bank assets in the U.S. equaled 56% of the U.S. economy. Wow. So with 5,177 commercial bank and savings institutions, they're saying no to the digital dollar. Hmm. Well, you can see that there are 12 Federal Reserve Banks, 24 branches that make up the Federal Reserve System. The 12 Reserve Banks uh, are the arms of the Central Bank, which is um, stationed in Washington, D.C. And you can see most of them are on the East Coast and the, and the Midwest, although here we have on the um, 12th boundary area of, of the um, of the uh, <laughs> ge geographic boundaries, we've got San Francisco here for the taking care of all of these um, Western states. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's it doesn't sound good to me that they're getting a pushback from the uh, American Bankers Association at all. All right, let's get into XRP. This is Crypto Noticias. They are arguably one of the most followed medias for the Spanish speaking cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem. And they have what, 75,000 followers on Twitter. So yeah, they're, they're pretty dominant. They interviewed uh, the Bitso employee. This is Gabriela Belden. She's the market leader at Bitso. And the exchange in Mexico uh, is facilitating that on-demand liquidity, which uses the digital asset XRP. And they're doing it with the U.S. to Mexican corridor, which is so successful. This corridor is a shining, shining star as an example of what can happen when you get a corridor liquid. And this corridor is the third largest in the world. So the interview is actually a podcast, and the podcast... Um, we learned many things, including their plan to go into Brazil and Argentina. So on July 1st, I think it was, yeah, they uploaded that podcast onto YouTube. And it's all about XRP for one hour. The remittances are being transacted, are very much focused on a business to business basis. Now, of course, they're doing a lot of, um, customer to family as well, but really they talk about how they have cracked that nut. So to sex successfully crack the SME solution is exactly the shift that ODL is moving towards right now with Ripple. And they reiterated that the company goal was to cover at least 20% of transfers from the U.S. to Mexico corridor. That's a big number for the third largest corridor in the world. And the increase uh, for the use of cross-border services using Ripple is happening despite economic slowdown. That is what is so interesting. Bitso has seen an increase of remittances using XRP and they've managed so far to cover up to 10%. So I think reaching their 20% is going to be very easy for them to do. That equates to 1.6 million households. That's a lot of people. So customers do not know that XRP is being used, she says in this podcast, and they don't need to know that it's being used to move their money. But what they do know is they see the benefit of the speed and cost and especially the difference when you convert from peso to dollar or dollar to peso. It's actually it's actually uh, moving those dollars into pesos. And it's processed in a matter of hours as opposed to days as, as everyone had to endure before. So Bitso thought that they would see a decrease with this current situation, but looks like it's totally immune to the current global slowdown. And that's so interesting. Because from March to April, check this out, check this out. Mexico itself overall had a decrease of 28.5%, yet 
BITSO had an increase. And the increase was modest. Well, let's take a look, for example, um, when we look at the week weekly volumes of remittances that are happening in 2020, you've got about $703 million a week going in that corridor. And BITSO in May took anywhere from 41 to $45 million of that total amount. That's a big chunk. So they saw this increase uh, from January of 3%. And actually, they're, they're, that's, that's in the six month period, but they're actually tracking more like a 6% increase now. So co compare this. They did uh, $10 million a week in November 2019. And now they're achieving that 41 to 45 million a week. That really highlights their exponential growth. And on June 29th, Bitso launched their transfer service in Argentina. And this is led by a gentleman whose name is Miguel Kudri. Oh, and he is one that uh, did it by designing a new app for them. This announcement, which you can see on Cointelegraph from the Spanish speaking side of Cointelegraph, also came with a heads up and the heads up of that portion of this release comes with a statement anticipate digital payments and it'll be without commission instantly and with immediate liquidity in their local currency that is assured <laughs> so taking that right from the article allowing for crypto to crypto or crypto to fiat I think we're seeing the digital space for payments being completely reshaped and redefined here. So this can happen to anyone, anytime. And as of this article, remittances for XRP increased 320% in six months. Miguel Kudri, again, who is leading this project, he tweeted out that he would talk about the discovery of payments on Friday, June 26th at 1 p.m. And he was gonna do it on an online event presented by Expo EFI, which has been uploaded onto YouTube, but I'm sorry, I need someone from the XRP community who speaks Spanish to listen and give us all the details because what I have pulled is from articles that have been written. So for the English speaking community, I do believe we're going to get a big announcement from Craig DeWitt of Ripple and Santiago Alvardo, Alvarado, Al Alvardo, Alvardo of Bitso this Wednesday. And it's uh, an online event again. You can register to join. I have done so. I'll try to catch it. Of course, I'll try to report anything quickly. But it's going to be all about crypto for cross border payments in Latin America look to hear of a new corridor possibly that's going live and if so it possibly could be argentina that's my guess because santiago is the director of cross-border payments at bitso and there is a representative from ripple that's going to join him there yeah the quality of people in this space that that Bitso and Ripple and all their partners are able to attract is really impressive because Santiago is a Harvard guy. He used to work for Tesla in their supply chain, and he's also an expert in mobile bill payments with his experience with Tempo. I just, yeah, the, when you get these kinds of people in the lead of driving these projects, um, you have to have a lot of confidence in them. So am I speculating too much? I don't think so. Uh, in this Bank Magazine article written on June 29th, there are some key points like crypto can be sent as a payment to people who are not BITSO users and it can be converted and extracted in the local currency with immediate liquidity via a QR code on the phone or web with just a phone number 
or email. This is the same exact technology, the payments app in the Siam Commercial Bank and also MoneyTap in Japan have with this QR code using only a phone, phone number and an email and they run on Ripple. So I think you're in for a big announcement with Craig and Santiago. I'm so looking forward to that. All right, everybody. Yeah, we are going to jump to some fluff. Oh, until I tell you that I premiered today on the Chain channel, and that was fun. I was a guest with them yesterday morning, my time, eight in the morning, very early for a Sunday morning, but I did it with, uh, with a lot of um, fun, actually. And there's, I, we set a record, an hour and 36 minutes, I think, we spoke. So I'm so sorry that it's so long. And the end is all about food. But in the beginning, I really do, um, I think, drive home a few points when it comes to uh, XRP and ODL and where it's at and where it's going and all that. You know, there are two regions of this world that are really getting um, some serious progress, and that is Asia and also Latin America. And in terms of ODL, I think. Latin America is uh, a nose ahead of um, Asia, but I think when Asia does go live, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a shocker for everybody. I really do think that. All right, so now let's jump to the fluff. I'll put a link to this down in the comment section below. Koike-san, she is the governor again for a second term. She won yesterday. She's one of the few women <laughs> politics although it's getting better in japan but still we don't have a good representation for women in politics and she is one that is uh i am yeah nice well every politician's controversial right and it and i don't love her just because she's a woman but uh, she does have um She's strong, and so she has her own mind, and she actually is a graduate from the University of Cairo in Egypt, and she was a newscaster, and she's just got a really full career, and she's um, finishing it off as being a second-term governor for Tokyo, and she's you know, this has been a um, tough time, mostly, of course, because of the health issues that every city is is um is having to face but also too the loss of the olympics this year was really a difficult one to get through so i think she probably she gained some confidence uh, from people who seem to know where she stands although i have a really good friend i know she's gonna watch this I don't dare say her name. And I know she's not happy with this outcome. And, and it's not that I'm happy with the outcome. I'm just reporting, right? I'm neutral. <laughs> but um, the fact that I would even say that I think it's, um, I can't say anything because my friend is going to get, get so mad at me. She is, she's not, she doesn't happen to be a fan of Koike san. So, um, and I know, yeah, okay, so I stopped there. Oh gosh, I'm just digging myself in a hole and I don't wanna re, I don't, I'm gonna do a Kevin Cage. It's like uh, one one take and uncut. So sorry, everybody. I just um, kind of backpack pedaled on what I should be saying. And it's really all due to my friend who I know will watch this video and she's Japanese and she voted for somebody else and she, definitely let me know that yesterday through a, through a text message. Okay, yeah, okay. I do wanna show you though, this is part of our new world. This is um, AI that can read the quality of the tuna cut. So can you imagine? I mean, you don't, you don't touch it, smell it, look at it. You just use this app and it'll just give you 
the feedback as to the quality of that particular fish. That is, in my mind, kind of blew me away because I can see down the road, I can just see the applications for AI with food. You know, you'll be able to, you'll be able to put up something into a peach and it'll be able to tell you how sweet that peach is. I mean, I just, this is going to be mind blowing in the future too, to see how these applications develop. And then the Bank of Japan, which, yeah, I don't know if you're interested in checking it out, but I am because I love the old um, architecture, especially, especially the architecture that's turn of the century that has a Western influence. It's so darn quality. It's amazing. And here is an old uh, horse uh, hitching post with water for the horse as well. Uh, quite interesting. And they also just recently uploaded on June 20th, the inside of the vault where they, of course, store the money and I didn't see any gold. In fact, when I looked at this whole video, which is just a couple minutes long, I did see some bins of money, but for the most part, it looks pretty empty. And just think about it in the near future, there's just no need for this at all. When we go totally digital, there's just no need for any storage like this. But I just it's kind of fun. It's kind of interesting to see what they built uh, more than a hundred years ago to protect the currency, the fiat. So interesting, huh? But look how empty it is. It's just totally, there is, like I said, some bins towards the end, but we're not going to wait that long to see them. Oh, here, here's some bins right here. So there's, there's some, <laughs> not a lot. I'm I'm afraid if there's a bank run, <laughs> we're in big trouble. Oh my gosh. And then I'm going to leave you with another kind of futuristic where we're going. But this, when I first saw this, I thought, oh no, not more robots. I mean, this country loves its robots. And I thought, oh no, one more, one more situation where somebody's going to lose their job. But not this case. This is actually going to be rolled out this summer in the convenience stores. It's for the Family Mart stores. And it's a robot that's going to be, uh, the function behind the robot actually is a real person sitting at home. So they still have the person who's sitting at, or still employing a person, but they're going to be taught how to use this robot and the robot will be there. Uh, this is going to be actually, I think, you know, think about it. If we really get another huge, big spike in this situation in the fall, um, food is an essential, uh, part of everybody's lives. Let's hope the supply chains can keep up with all the challenges, but you can actually be, um, helped and serviced by a robot who is, who is working that still as a job from home in a very safe environment. I think, I think this was great. So I think it's pretty wonderful. All right, everybody. Yes, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.